Hello everyone and welcome to the first demonstration video, part one of the leaded steel bushings project for machining 220. So today we're going to be covering maybe a more general topic, um, which is required in order to discuss the rest of the project, and that is aligning the workpiece in the four jaw chuck. Okay, this is really similar to like trimming a head in on the milling machine, something that you're going to be doing a lot. It's an essential skill for machinists, and it's worth going over in some detail. So uh, looking at this four jaw chuck, which we have on the spindle right now, okay, uh, what differentiates this from a three jaw chuck is not only that it has four jaws, one, two, three, four jaws right here instead of three, but also that this is considered a, uh, an independent chuck rather than a self-centering chuck. Meaning that when I turn the screws, okay, each jaw moves independently. So you move one jaw at a time, right? And each one's got its own screw that adjusts it, all right? As opposed to a self-centering chuck where, you know, any one of the screws that you select, okay, they all move a scroll plate on the back of the jaws, which moves all of the jaws together, right? So it's self-centering. I mean, it's relatively self-centering within a few thousandths of an inch, but it's not perfectly self-centering, okay? A four-jaw chuck, actually, you can get this to center apart nearly perfectly. Basically, the only limitations are your own skills and the resolution of the indicator, right? Those are the only things that affect how concentric you can get a part to the spindle axis, okay? So, yes, this takes a little bit more time. It requires a little bit more skill, but in many applications, when you need to get something running perfectly true, uh, this is really the only way to do it. Now, I've gone ahead and removed the compound rest uh, from the cross slide because uh, I don't want it getting in the way. Uh, you don't have to do this, okay? This is just so that I can get everything inside of the camera frame. So here's a piece that we can mess around with, okay? This is the same uh, one and a half inch diameter leaded steel stock that we're going to use for the bushings, okay? It's just a little remnant piece, All right? So we're going to play around with this a little bit. So the first step here, whenever you're getting something centered in the jaws, is to get it rough aligned, right? So that we're, you know, relatively close. Our indicator is not going to have to make up a whole bunch of distance um, and because it has a limited range, right? And uh, so the best way to do this is to use the concentric rings that they have uh, machined into the end of the four jaw chuck right here, okay, into the face. So there's one, two, three, four of them on this particular chuck, okay? So what we're going to do is pick a reference feature on the chuck jaws. Like, for example, the, uh, the intersection of this surface and this surface at that edge right there. And we're going to line that up with the concentric rings, right? It doesn't have to be on a ring, okay? But it has, you know, we're just going to use that as a reference. And what we're going to try to do is get this piece to slip through the jaws, right? Uh, to just slip through the jaws and have all of the jaws at the same position relative to the rings. And then when we tighten this down, you know, we can get this within like 10 thousandths or so. Sometimes more, sometimes less. I once accidentally got it within a thousandth of an inch doing it this way, but that was only one time. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and try doing that. Okay, so let's open this up a little bit. Is that gonna slip through? Not quite, right? I'm going to open, they're, they're all at about the same position right now. So I'm just going to open them all up a little bit until this thing slips through. Okay, is it going to go? Yes. So it just slides through. So I'm going to have this sticking out maybe about that much. I'll have just like one, one inch or so inside the jaws, okay? Then I'm going to try and tighten everything down equally as well to kind of keep that position. Okay, I'm not going to get it like super tight right now because I still have to make my fine adjustments. So to do our fine adjustments, we're going to use an indicator mounted on a magnetic base like this one. Okay, so this is the same style of indicator, a dial travel indicator that we use on the ways in order to get movements on the carriage. 
This one's got a magnetic back on it, while this one is mounted on the, the stem and post of this style of magnetic base. So the magnetic base goes onto whatever surface you want. I'm going to put it on the top of the cross slide here. Now one nice thing about these bases is that they're very, very rigid, right? Because once you clamp everything down, they really don't move around a lot. And that's very, very nice for making fine measurements, right? Because you don't want your instruments to start moving around and introducing inaccuracies. But as maybe you can see, it's a little bit awkward and fumbly to adjust them. To make it a little bit easier on yourself, you can use a tool like this. This is also a magnetic base here with an on-off switch, but it has an articulating arm, right? So a couple ball and socket joints, three ball and socket joints, okay? And then a single adjustment right here, right? So once you find your position, indicator goes right here. Once you find your position, you just lock it down, and then there you go, right? It's super easy to position these. They're not as rigid as the stem and post style, but they're super convenient, right? Um, we don't have these out for people to use, okay? This is my personal um, mag base, but I would say that this is one of the top quality of life improvements for a machinist. And so it's probably one of the first tools you're going to want to buy for yourself. Okay, I went ahead and readjusted this indicator just so that it would be really easy to see on the camera. Okay, so if I loosen the mag base here, I can actually move it in and out so that I can get it inside of its travel. And I'm just going to kind of put it halfway in its travel and adjust it so that the zero is facing away from me, right? Because that's just going to be easier for me to read. We don't have to do it this way, but it makes it a lot easier. It's just more intuitive this way, right? So I'm zeroed over this jaw right here, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and spin this up and take a measurement. Okay, so it goes positive, okay, and then goes back down to negative. And now we're back at our zero, okay? So we actually got it within, let's see, this is 13 positive, and then this is minus 8. So, wow, okay, right around 20 thousandths, okay, just by I, I mean, that's pretty good. So let's talk about what we're going to do here to correct for this. When we're indicating something in the four jaw chuck, we're actually trying to accomplish two things at once, okay? We are trying to get the part center, right? But we're also trying to get it clamped rigidly. Now, the way that this clamps is that you've got two jaws that tighten opposite one another, and they sandwich the part. And so we've got this jaw and this jaw, but then we've also got this jaw and this jaw, okay? So we've got two sets of jaws, basically, that tighten against one another. So the only positions that we have for adjustment are at the jaws. And so what's important to remember is that we only care about opposing points. Okay, so this jaw and this jaw need to agree to one another, right? And this jaw and this jaw need to agree to one another, but the two sets of jaws do not need to agree to one another. That's because this part may be out of round, okay? If this part is perfectly round, then when we spin it up, it's going to read zero if it's perfectly concentric to the spindle axis, okay? But this can be concentric to the spindle axis and still not read zero all the way around because it's not round, right? So the form or the shape of the part factors into our readings. But we want to get rid of the errors that come from the form of the part. We want to isolate just the concentricity of the center axis of the part and the center axis of the spindle, okay? So we're going to go for opposing points and we're not going to care what it reads all the way around. The second part of this is that as we're making our adjustments on the jaws, we're going to be tightening one jaw against another, right? So what we're going to have to do is if we want to move or shift the part in a specific direction, we're going to have to loosen one jaw and then tighten the other one, right? You can kind of get away with smushing the part down by tightening only one jaw, all right? But at some point, you're, you're just not going to be able to adjust it anymore. And so you're going to have to loosen the jaw that's 180 degrees opposite. And on a part like this, which at this point is still stock material, right, it's uh, solid all the way through and we're clamping onto just, you know, rough stock surfaces. 
We're not worried about crushing the part by over clamping it, and we're not worried about marring the surface by um, tightening the hardened jaws that have little serrations on them, by tightening the hardened jaws against that surface, because everything's going to get cut off anyway. But we're going to want to be really careful if we're trying to indicate a finished surface, right? I mean, if we're clamping on a finished surface, um, and if this is like a piece of pipe or something, because it's very easy to, to crush something that is hollow in the center, okay? So for delicate parts, we definitely don't want to just go, you know, doing all of our adjustments by tightening on the jaws, right? We're really going to want to have a minimal amount of clamping, just enough to secure the part without crushing it. Okay, so with all of that in mind, let's take another measurement now, just 180 degrees opposed. And I do like to mark the jaws so that I know which pair of jaws I'm looking at, right? Which direction I'm looking at. So I'll just give this one an X. The 180 degree opposed gets an X. Uh, then the 90 degree, let's give it a zero. And then another zero right there. Okay, so let's measure the X's first. Okay, I've got zero right here, and I've got plus eight right there. Okay, so if this is reading plus eight, meaning clockwise eight, that means that the plunger, like if I pull back on the plunger, you can see it moves even more towards the clockwise direction. Okay, so if it's moving clockwise direction, then that means that the plunger is being pushed out more by this side of the part than by the other side. Okay, so what that means is that I have to tighten this jaw down so that it pushes the part this way. So how big of an adjustment am I going to make? When I move this jaw, it's going to push the part in that direction. Okay. But let's say that I move this a thousandth of an inch or something like that, right? If I move the part a thousandth in this direction, if I have an indicator on the other side of the part, it's also going to register a thousandth of an inch of movement, but in the exact opposite direction, okay? So what this tells us is that any changes we make to one side of the part, right, the same thing is going to happen to the other side of the part, but in the opposite direction, right? So if I was zero on this side and eight thousandths on this side, then I need to split the difference and move the part four thousandths in this direction because it's also going to move four thousandths in this direction, and that's my eight right there. Let me actually go ahead and set up an indicator on the other side so that you can see this in action. Okay, I'm going to set that to zero right there just so that uh, the two of them agree to each other. Okay, I'm going to zero this one as well. Okay, so now let me make that adjustment, all right? Remember, I have four thousandths to go. Okay, do you see that? So this one actually registered more like uh, three and a half or something like this, and this one went four. Okay, but I think that you see the principle here, right? That this moved in the negative direction, and this one moved in the positive direction. Okay, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you, but I'm going to go back to this view so that you can see how I actually do this, right? Now what I'm going to want to do is check the other side, okay? So I adjusted this by four thousandths, re-zeroed it, and now I'm going to check the other side. All right, and now it's only out like two thousandths, okay? So it's not perfect, right? We didn't get it exactly bang on, right? But it got a lot closer, right? So this sort of indicating uh, process is what they call iterative, which is just a fancy way of saying that it's a lot of guess and check, right? That's really the fastest way to do it, okay? So if this side is two thousandths in the negative direction, that means that the plunger is further this way on this side, right? So actually we need to bring this side out towards us, right? So I could go ahead and loosen this right now, and I wouldn't want to loosen it two thousandths, I want to loosen it back to that one thousandths. So like right there, okay, now let me re-zero that. Okay, so we're, we're really, really close now, okay, right around the zero on both sides. Now let me do the 90 degree opposite sides, right, because even if we get uh, these two sides, the sides that we just did, zero, the fact that the other two are so far out, it's going to mess with our measurements. 
okay? So here I've got, uh, well, let, let me actually go ahead and re-zero this. So zero here, and I've got negative 18, negative 19, something like that on this side, okay? So because I know that these jaws are still kind of loose, I'm going to go back to the original side, and I'm going to adjust this by tightening, okay? So it was 18 out, so I'm going to try and shoot for like nine thousandths. I probably won't be able to get all of that. No, at about that point, it's getting too tight now. Okay, so I only got five thousandths. So let me re-zero this, and let's go back to this side. Okay, now this side is about nine or ten thousandths out. So let me split the difference here by backing off this jaw. And actually, at about this point, it starts getting really loose, okay? So let's see what we did on the other side. Okay, yeah, we're really close there, right? Let me re-zero this. Yeah, so this side is uh, still minus one thousandths or so. Okay, so let's go back over here. And let's adjust it that, let's say, like a half of a thousandths or so. Right there. Re-zero it. Zero. Okay, maybe like, I don't know, a half a thousandths over. This side now, let's go back to the 90 degree surfaces, the X surfaces. So, re-zero this. This is zero and about one thousandths plus. Okay, so let me go ahead and crank that down just a little bit. Re-zero. Okay, zero. Zero, just a, a hair below zero. Okay, re-zero this side. Zero and one thousandths plus. Let me crank down on this then. Yeah, that was actually pretty loose. Okay. Okay, so pretty good right there. Now, when we get to this point where it's pretty much zero everywhere, let me see. Zero, 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 zero everywhere. Okay. It also tells me that this part is uh, pretty round, right? Because uh, zero on one set of jaws is zero on the other. Okay, so that means that it's round. Um, but now when we're zero pretty much everywhere, okay, then it's time to ensure that we're both indicated and clamped rigidly. Okay, so I just go around the circle and tighten the jaws an equal amount by feel. And you can see that the indicator does move a little bit, but if you tighten them all equally, then hopefully they all move back to your position. Okay, so let's check it. Zero, half under, half under, zero. Okay, so everywhere where it says zero, I'm going to give it another little crank. Okay, right there, it's just a little bit high. All right. Re-zero this. Zero everywhere. It's a tiny little bit of movement, okay? So using this method, you can indicate something in, I mean, really, the sky's the limit. Basically, the resolution of your indicator. I mean, so if we get this reading zero, that doesn't mean that it's actually zero. It just means that it's as close as we can get with this indicator. But if we put an indicator in here with a finer resolution, we could get it even closer within you know, 50 millionths of an inch or whatever it is, okay? So your instrument and your skill with the four-jaw chuck is really the only thing that limits you here. Let me run through this one more time so that you can see how fast the process can actually go. Okay, so I removed the part and I knocked out the jaws. So let's see if this goes in. It does not. All right, let's open that up a little bit. Do they all agree to one another? Yeah, they're pretty close. Still not going. This one is maybe a little bit further in than the others. Let's see, this one's a little further in than the others. Okay, there we go, now it's going in. Okay, holding on to about an inch of it. I'm just gonna tighten all these down in equal amounts so that it centers up. Okay, there I'm touching everywhere. Okay, good. Time for the magnetic base. Okay, set this down there. Bring it in. 
zero it. Let's zero it right here on, let's start with the, well, let's just be consistent. Let's start with an X. Ooh, I wasn't as close this time as I was last time. No matter. Okay, zero, and what is it 180 degrees? Plus 50, about plus 50. So that means that this side needs to go in a little bit. That's about all I get. So then I have to bring it out on this side. 20, okay, I need to go in a little bit more here, right around there. Let me readjust the magnetic base. Right there, so zero, and what are we here? Just a little bit under, okay, so let me back that off a little bit. Okay, yeah, we're right there, all right? But you can see that the other direction is swinging wildly, so we're gonna have to check that now. Okay, let's check the zeros. All right, let me readjust the zero on this one. Zero, minus 30. Okay, that means this side needs to come out a little bit. Okay, that's already pretty loose. Let me go over here and uh, adjust this with uh, tightening. Okay, that's about all I can get. So this side needs to come out then. Okay, let me re-zero that, it's pretty close. Okay, so about minus six over here. So let me tighten this side down. About three. Re-zero it. Okay, back to zero. So what did that do to the first two positions that we adjusted? Let's go back to the X's, okay. Definitely moved, so zero plus five. What if I tighten this down? About that much. Readjust my zero. What's the other side say? Minus one. Okay, so let me loosen it a little bit. Minus, minus one. Right there, pretty close. Zero. Zero. Zero a little bit bigger. Zero, zero. Okay, now let's go back to the X's. Zero, zero. All right, no problem. So realistically, what's the tolerance here? If this is a finished part, right, if we're indicating in a finished diameter so that we can machine another feature that has to be concentric to that finished diameter, then we've got to get this dead on, right? Zero everywhere. But this is just a piece of stock, okay? Um, it's not even, I mean, this one actually ended up being pretty round, but, you know, it might not be round, okay? And so we don't care quite that much how concentric this is in the spindle, right? Especially because as soon as we take a cut everything is going to true up to the spindle. That new diameter that we cut in this setup is going to be concentric to the spindle because it was spinning on the spindle axis, okay? So for the exercise, we're gonna ask you to get within one thousandth of an inch, so between two graduations, right? This is something that you should practice. But in the real world, it doesn't really matter when it's stock, okay? You can get it within a few, I mean, it's not that hard to get it within a thousandth of an inch, okay? Um, but, you know, I mean, it might be <laughs> challenging your first time, but uh, after a while it'll get a lot easier, okay? It's something that you need to practice, though. But you could be a few thousandths of an inch out, and it wouldn't really make a big difference, okay? If you're really, really far out, uh, then you may not have enough material to actually clean up the, the stock material to get your final dimension on there, right? So it just has to be inside of that range. I guess the other thing is that if you offset this too much, then it's going to be really unbalanced, and that can affect uh, part finish and dimensional accuracy and things like that. But a few thousandths of an inch is not going to affect anything. So I'm actually going to kill two birds with one stone here and demonstrate what happens if you offset it and then take a cut, okay? And the first point here is that right now we just indicated the, uh, the stock concentric to the spindle axis, but what if we want to, let's say, drill or bore a hole 
and we don't want it to be concentric to the outside diameter, let's say that we want it to be offset in one direction a very specific amount. The nice thing about the four jaw chuck is that you can also make things precision eccentric to each other. So if you indicate this outside surface so that it's uh, zero here and here, but it's, let's say, offset by 50 thousandths here and here, okay, then you can go ahead and drill and bore a hole and it's going to be offset to the outside diameter by that exact amount. And so there are situations where you might want to generate features that have that particular relationship to one another, okay? Like, a, I don't know, like a, a cam or something like that. So now we've got basically zero, zero, and then here we've got plus 25 and minus 25. So if we zero it here, we've got 50. So 50 thousandths offset, okay? Now let's take a cut. Turn this on. So you can see that it's running out, okay? It's wobbling considerably, all right? Now I'm gonna take a cut on the front face. See what that does? Okay, so the fact that the part is wobbling does not affect our ability to machine a flat face on the end of the part. Okay, that's good to know. All right, now let me come over and touch off on the diameter. All right, and I'll take a cut of 20 thousandths of an inch. Right there. So that's pretty interesting, right? So it only cut on one side and not on the other. I mean, it makes sense, right? Because the diameter is offset, okay? But this diameter that we just cut, that diameter is concentric to the spindle, right? But it is exactly 50 thousandths of an inch eccentric to this diameter. In order to get a full cleanup on this diameter, I'm gonna have to take, well, I took 20 thousandths. I'm gonna have to take another, let's see, if this is 50 thousandths offset, I'm gonna have to take another 80 thousandths on the diameter because I have to take off 100 thousandths on the diameter to account for a 50 thousandths radial offset. Okay, let's do it. Okay, almost, but uh, not quite. There's still just a little bit there, all right? And actually, this gets at something that's really important which is that when we indicated the part in, we indicated at only one location. That will ensure that the part is running true to the spindle axis only if the two axes are parallel to one another. So if the two axes are parallel to one another and you indicate the diameter and that will bring the centers together, right? They will be collinear to one another. But if the axis of the part is not parallel to the spindle axis, like if the part is cocked out in the jaws, okay, and you indicate in one spot, you can get the part aligned, but only in that one spot. If you move the indicator to any other position along the axis of the shaft, these, the axes will not agree at those points, right? So it'll run true here, but if you move the indicator over here or over here, it, it's not gonna run true, okay? And then if you take a cut like this, this is what you're gonna get right, where it cleaned up over here, but not over here. So this means that the part is actually kicked out like this. Well, actually like this, if I line up my finger with the, uh, the cut marks on there, okay, it's kicked out like that. So on this side, the material is actually closer to the cutting tool than on this side, all right? So if I were to bring this around 180 degrees opposed, now it's like this, right? Now you can see that it's closer to the cutting tool. Right? So if I were to take a cut all the way down the length of the part, right, this patch of uncut material would get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? So in order to account for this, you would actually need to indicate in two places on the diameter and get both of those points to agree to each other. Right? That way we would make sure that the axes were parallel to one another and that they were also collinear. That's what we're looking for, okay? But that's much more difficult to do than just picking a single position, right? And it's something I'll talk about later, but 
for indicating a piece of stock in, it's actually not that important, but it's very important for indicating in a finished diameter. Let me go ahead and take another little cut on here just to true up this surface entirely. All right, let's go ahead and put the indicator on here now and see what it reads. Okay. Yep. Zero everywhere. So the material that we just cut, that diameter is running true to the spindle axis. But if I put it over here onto that raw material, okay, that's still running out. Okay, so that just shows you the relationship there. But wait, there's more. The part itself doesn't even need to be round in order to be indicated in the four jaw chuck. So I'm going to indicate this piece of square stock in the jaws and I'll show you what happens. Hopefully this is going to drive home the concept that you only need to indicate opposing points on the jaws and not all around the part, right? Because you can accomplish this even with something which only has four sides, right? And basically what we're gonna be doing, we imagine that there is a circle inside of this material, okay? And this is the, the maximum inscribed circle, meaning that what is the biggest circle that we can inscribe inside of those four sides so that it's touching all four sides, right? I mean, this is not a good drawing, but this is the basic idea, okay? So when we indicate the four sides of the square stock, what we're going to be doing is actually touching the maximum contour of the cylinder that's hiding inside of this material, okay? So basically the tangent point where the circle touches the square side, okay? Here, 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 and here. Once we have all of those four points in agreement, it doesn't matter what this, this extra material here is doing. As soon as we spin this up and take a cut, we're gonna get a circle that is concentric to a center axis that we could construct, right, between those four sides. Let me demonstrate. Okay, let's get this pretty close, just based off of the concentric rings there. Okay, let's bump the indicator up there. Maybe something like that. All right, zero it. Okay, I'm on one of the X's here. And so what I need to do is find exactly where that maximum contour of the cylinder hiding inside of the square stock is, okay? To do that, I just need to move this up and down until I find the spot where the indicator finds a low point, a point, a maximum point in the minus direction, and then sort of turns around again. You see that? That's what I'm looking for. So I'm gonna zero that out right there. Okay, now I'm gonna go 180 degrees opposed. Okay, now I'll do the same thing on the other side. Where is the point? Okay, so one thing that we have to be really careful about is that we have to keep an eye on the revolution counter as well as just the um, the arm on the main uh, 100 thousandths of an inch scale, okay? So let, let me see, where was I on this side? Okay, between the zero and the four. Okay, and here I'm, I'm at about 20. Okay, so I, actually I'm really close to the zero. So I'll push this side out a little bit. And I'm going to re-zero it. Okay, so there I am. I'm 10 thousandths out. Now I'm going to pull this out a little bit, back the screw off. It's about that far. See what it did to the other side. Okay. And right there, that should be it. So zero, pull it back. Okay, and about one or two thousandths low. 
Okay, let's go ahead and go 90 degrees. Okay, what are we here? We're at, well, minus eight. I'm gonna re-zero that. I have no idea if this uh, square stock is really square. Okay, so that's plus 10 or so. Go ahead and tighten this side down, right there. See where we are now, zero. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm pulling this back so that I don't hammer on the plunger and the contact point right there, right? Because if I'm trying to force it, then that, uh, that corner is gonna come bearing down on top of this and I'm gonna lose my position and it can potentially damage the indicator. Wow, okay, right, right there at zero. This side, right there at zero. Okay, let's go to 90 degrees. Okay, about a thousandths over. Okay, about two thousandths over. So, yeah, folks, that's, that's it. <laughs> if opposing points are pretty much zero, then that means that this is concentric, despite not being a round shape. So now I'm gonna take a cut on this and we'll see what happens. Okay, you can see that this thing is actually running concentrically. It's not wobbling, right? Let's take a facing cut. Okay. So you could hear that when I first engaged the cut, it was only, it was only contacting the outside tips, right? The points on the square. Um, but actually it was able to machine a flat surface just fine. So here's a potentially fun and interesting way for you to clean up the end of a piece of square stock. Let's take a diameter cut. So when I come over here and touch off on the outside of the material, okay, there I'm just touching the points of the square. I'll take a cut of 50 thousandths, make it 100 thousandths. So now we're cutting a diameter uh, but it's only big enough to lop off the points of the square, okay? But that diameter that it's cutting is very concentric now to the spindle axis. But I'm gonna have to remove significantly more material to get down to where the, uh, the cylinder that I'm cutting is just touching the outside surfaces of the square. Now, you heard that very loud sort of chopping noise, right? And that was those four corners slapping up against the top of the tool, okay? This is what's called an interrupted cut, right? Where the cutting tool is not continuously engaged in material. Actually, there's like this impact, right? And actually it happens four times every revolution. You get this impact on the top of the tool, okay? This loading and unloading, this cycling of forces on the tool is something that cutting tools in general don't like, but tungsten carbide especially doesn't like. You can see that with each cut, we get closer and closer and closer, all right? We're not quite there yet, but you can see that the little unfinished material here on the center is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and uh, it's the same size on all of the four sides. Right, and that's an indication that we uh, indicated this incorrectly. Okay, let me keep going. There we go. So now we have a full diameter being cut on the square stock. So this diameter is now not only concentric to the spindle axis, but because we indicated the square stock in so well, now it's also very concentric to the axis of the four sides of the square stock, which I think is pretty cool. So hopefully that hammers home that we only care about opposing points when we are indicating something in a four-jaw chuck and that a workpiece does not need to be round to be concentric to the spindle axis. Okay, if you're just starting with the leaded steel bushings project and you haven't even started roughing your part out yet, I would say that's plenty of information and the demonstration is done. Okay, so you can go ahead and stop watching 
And thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time for part two. But for the rest of you, okay, I am going to go through how to indicate in a finished diameter. Because this actually comes up fairly frequently out there in the real world machine shop, especially if you're like a maintenance machinist. Right, as a maintenance machinist, you're probably not going to be making that many parts from just raw stock. Um, you're going to be doing a lot of rework of, uh, you know, like castings, things that are large and expensive, and you're not just going to machine a new one, you're going to keep rebuilding the same sort of basic skeletal structure over and over and over again, right? And in this case, you may already have some finished diameters, uh, but you may need to renew one of the diameters, right? Because maybe it's worn down, and so now you, you need to just clean it up, right? So then you have to indicate in all of the other diameters and then cut that new diameter so that it's concentric to all the existing ones, right? That's pretty common, right? So if you do that, then you really need to know how to adjust everything more finely, more accurately than just putting an indicator on it and getting it to within a thousandth of an inch. The other reason why I want to go over this is because uh, on the leaded steel bushings project, it states very clearly in the project planning worksheet that there is a point of no return, right? Once you start finishing diameters, you can't just go taking the part out and then put it back in and expect to be able to machine everything concentric to each other. There are some very tight tolerances for runout and for perpendicularity on the leaded steel bushings project, and it's very easy to hit those tolerances if you keep everything in the machine. If you machine everything in one setup, then just by nature of how a lathe works, everything's going to be, you know, concentric and perpendicular, right? All the flat faces will be perpendicular to the center axis. All the diameters will be concentric to the center axis, okay? But if you take this out and you put it back in, right, then you have to indicate everything back in so that it's concentric, right? Otherwise, whatever you machine from that point on will be concentric to the spindle, but it won't be concentric to the rest of the stuff that you've already finished. Okay, so there's a point of no return. It's basically after you've roughed everything out, but before you start finishing anything. But in any case, sometimes it does happen that you will need to take the leaded steel bushings out of the four jaw chuck and put them back in, and then you're going to have to re-indicate. Okay, re-indicate everything to a finished diameter. So I'm going to show you how to do that now. I'm going to use this piece of material. This is basically like what you would have if, let's say, this outside diameter here was finished, right? Let's imagine that the outside diameter is finished. How would we indicate the rest of the part into that outside diameter right there? Okay, let's do it. So I'm going to get it just kind of roughly in by eye with the concentric rings, as always. Then I'm going to put the indicator on it, like right there, zero it out, okay? I'm going to take a reading, 0, okay, that's plus 15, and then here I've got plus 10 and 0. Okay, so 0 plus something, all right, I'm going to go ahead and push that side in, 8, ah, pretty close, okay, this side, push this in as well, okay, now let me re-zero it. 0, minus 4, two, 2, okay, so that's pretty much good everywhere. I mean, it's awfully close, right? As I mentioned earlier, though, okay, getting it good in one spot is not good enough if this is a finished surface. Okay, so what happens if I move down a little ways, right here? Now let me indicate it. Oh, now it's really running out. Okay, because the center axis of this diameter and the center axis of the spindle are not parallel to one another, right? The part is cocked out at an angle like this. So where I indicated it in, like back here, let's say, okay, there I was able to find a spot where they were properly aligned. But as soon as I move the indicator out a little bit, okay, now it's not running true anymore. And so now this is what's going on. Okay. So what I need to do actually is get both of these diameters, both of these positions to read zero. 
So the way that I typically accomplish that is I will adjust the inside measurement with the jaws. The outside measurement I will adjust with a hammer. Okay, so I'll be smacking the part around. That will get the part axis parallel to the spindle axis, and then I will indicate them collinear to one another, concentric to one another. One problem that I'm going to run into is that I'm going to be fighting these jaws the whole way, okay? Because they're pretty long and they're holding onto a long section of the part, and they're made out of hardened steel, so, you know, they're not going to deform at all, right? So, when I'm smacking this around with a hammer, I'm not really going to have a whole lot of wiggle room for getting this thing off at a different angle. Basically, wherever it's sitting right now is where the jaws want to hold it, and that's about all I can get, okay? So the trick is that I need to put something soft in between the two pieces of material, and I need to hold on to a smaller patch of the part, right? That way I can create sort of like a pivot point, which is still rigid enough to support the cut when I go in to actually machine the material, but it's compliant enough so that I can smack the part around a little bit. So I use these little aluminum shims, all right? And I actually indicate the part in first, the way that we just did, so that it's close already, and then I back each one of these jaws out independently, one at a time, and stick this aluminum in there. Just that way, uh, you know, I can maintain a relatively close concentricity um, before I go in and do my final adjustments. So I'll back out this jaw right here, okay, just so that I can get this shim down in there. Just kind of line it up with the, uh, the front of the jaw there. And get it relatively square. Something like that. Okay, crank it back down. Okay, so let me move the indicator back in towards where I'm going to take my measurement that I'm going to adjust with the jaws, and let's see how far out we are. Yeah, not even that bad. Okay, so I'm about two thousandths plus here. Let me move that into zero. Okay, to zero. Okay. Zero here as well. So that's pretty much zero everywhere. Okay. Now let's go ahead and move over to the outside and indicate that as well. All right. So we're still only looking for opposing points, okay, folks? So here we're positive, here we're negative. So I'm actually going to go to where we're negative, and I'm going to bump it on the back side. Now this, what I'm doing to this indicator is uh, technically not appropriate, right? Uh, where I'm smacking the indicator and uh, basically shocking it so it's bouncing around every time I hit it with the hammer. Not a good thing to do because you can really, uh, you know, you can actually damage the clockwork inside of the dial indicator. But it's kind of hard to make this adjustment without hammering the plunger a little bit. Um, I mean, you can pull the plunger back and make your adjustments and then bring it back in just so that you can see how far you've moved. I mean, that's a good practice. It's going to be a little bit difficult to see what I'm doing on camera if I do that. So uh, I'm not going to. So that's zero, zero. Excellent. Okay, let's go 90 degrees. So here we've got uh, plus one and minus one. Okay, so let me adjust that as well. Oh. Okay, yeah, I, I went a little too far. Okay. Zero, 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 zero. Okay, that's great. Except when I go back to my original position, it's probably not going to be uh, indicated in properly. Yeah, so now that's out. Okay, so here's the game that you have to play. You have to keep going back and forth and back and forth. And every time you get this zero and then come over here to get this zero, then go back to the original position, right? It's going to get closer and closer and closer. And as soon as it's within tolerance, then you're good to go. Okay, so we've got zero here, zero here, uh, basically zero there, 
maybe just a tad bit over zero there. Out here we've got, maybe we just re-zero right there. So here we've got zero, opposite side just a little bit over zero. Okay, 90 degrees zero and just a little bit over zero. Okay, so we're getting into the limitations of what this indicator can resolve here. Okay, um, so it's moving at let's say like a quarter thousandths or something like that. Okay, both here and here. Um, that was not terribly easy to do. Okay, you've got to be a little bit of a dab hand with the indicator to get this thing to work. Um, and you know, why go through this if you don't have to? It can be even more difficult than this. Like on the leaded steel bushing, the first diameter that you finish is actually this inside diameter, right? So if you finish the inside diameter but nothing else, then you actually have to indicate to the inside diameter in two spots. That can be really challenging, right? You can't even get this type of indicator down in there. You have to use a test indicator like we use uh, for trimming in the mill head, okay? And that gets super awkward, especially because it has a very limited range. There is another way to do this, where instead of doing two diameters, you actually do one diameter and a face, right? As long as you know that the diameter and the face are very perpendicular to each other, okay, then you can do that, right? So if we finish this surface and this shoulder right there, we could put an indicator here on the diameter and an indicator on the, uh, on the shoulder. And if the shoulder reads zero and the diameter reads zero, right, then it has to be uh, properly and fully aligned. Indicating the shoulder in gets us the angular alignment, but indicating the diameter in gets us the concentricity, basically, okay? So don't do this unless you absolutely have to because it's quite finicky. But I thought that I would show you anyway because it's very possible that you may run into this situation, uh, if not in the machine shop here, then out in the world, okay? This is definitely something that takes a lot of practice, but now you know the basics. Anyway, so now we are truly done with this demonstration video. I hope that it's been useful and illuminating, and I'll see you in part two, where we actually go through and rough out the leaded steel bushings, and uh, thanks for watching. See ya.